Hello, this is Deborah Baker with Trusted CSET, and we're continuing on the CISSP. This is Security and Risk Management Part 4. Now, when you're building a security program, one of the first things that you want to do is have a set of security policies. And the main overarching security policy is the information security policy. I like to keep things succinct and to the point. So I would say that your security policy shouldn't be more than 20, maybe 25 pages max. And it's like overarching. There will be um, other policies, but everything will be covered, at least touched upon within the main security policy. So these are typical policies that you're going to have. So you're going to have an acceptable use. It may also be called code of conduct. They could be two separate or this combined. And for, for CISSP, it's, they talk about the acceptable use policy. So essentially everyone's responsible for using the company equipment and computer that's assigned to them responsible. And you typically will sign this when you are first hired. So then there is disaster recovery business continuity, which is really important. So you want to make sure that you have offline backups, failover, and offsite backup. And so this is all thing that you're going to have architected. You also, depending if you're a really big company, you probably are going to have a segmented section for backups, like where, like in your data center, and then you're going to have an offsite. Now there are some really great SaaS services that offer offline backup, um, failover, availability, and they have the built-in disaster recovery. So it, you know, it's going to be in a different location. Typically, um, in the old school, you would have like a hot site, a warm site, a cold site. And if your main data center was on the East Coast, then you would have your disaster recovery either in the Midwest or on the West Coast. But with these great um, backup SaaS services, you don't have to worry about it. But definitely want to make sure you have offline backups, which it doesn't talk about this in the CISSP, but that will save you in case of a ransomware attack because if you have online backups, the online backups will also get encrypted. So you'll have a data classification policy, which essentially you're gonna say, okay, that you've got these various levels data. And I just wanted to switch really quick and this takes you back to what I explained in an earlier video, but I was, I had actually been in the Air Force and had a top secret. On the commercial side, it's much, um, you know, not as stringent, of course, you're not going to have top secret, secret data. So you've got confidential, private, and you've got sensitive data, and you've got public data. And so you'll have a policy that describes what's consider considered confidential and private. So of course, you're going to have any sort of personally identifiable information of your employees would be need to be under that confidential and private, how you're going to handle it. And then it could even if you actually have a document, you would have on that document that it might say internal use, it might say confidential. So Howard is that your company wants to um, name these different levels and how you want to treat them. That's in that policy. So you've got a risk management policy. So essentially, this is identifying um, various threats, prioritizing, you know, are you going to, are you going to mitigate? Are you going to put a control in place? Are you going to transfer it? Are you going to accept the risk? So how your company handles risk is in the risk management policy. Logical access, which is essentially access control and principle of least privilege. That is in your logical access policy. Incident response policies. How are you going to handle it if there is an incident? So so identifying it, steps to take, you know, that are taken once you realize you've had an incident, that's in your incident response policy. And then your software development lifecycle policy, which is going to talk about basically secure by design. So your developers need to be thinking about threats and threat modeling and how to secure your product while they're actually architecting it 
and building. And so you'll also, this will be called, referred to as SDLC. Now, security standards are requirements for consistent use of technology. And there are baselines. A baseline establishes a basic security level that all systems across the organization must adhere. And so, for example, you can have baseline configuration and CIS is a great place to find out what those are. But when you first, you know, you have a new employee, you provision their laptop, you use a, we used to call it ghost image, but you'll have a baseline, a secure image that has all the software, already has, you know, strong password, um, two-factor authentication, all of this set up. So, you know, every single laptop that you issue is, you've already got a secure baseline. And you can find those best practices on the Center of Internet um, security website. Standards you can think of um, like SOC 2, ISO 27001, and they'll, they'll we'll talk about standards and framework. And then guidelines. Um, another thing about standards is like NIST 800, 53B, that's a standard. So guidelines, I don't really, people don't really talk about guidelines in the commercial space really, but um, as According to ISC Squared, guidelines provided suggestions for the implementation of standards and baseline. So, and there is always whatever it is, whether it's a standard or a baseline configuration, you know, you're going to have your own take. You may not do everything that CIS because it's going to lock down the computer too much. So you have to, you know, kind of decide on your set you know, for yourself, how your company's going to. Then we have standard operating procedures, which essentially step by step, how you're going to handle that new employee and provision their device. And what, what are those, th you know, what are those steps? And these are really important for ISO 27001, but it's just good operating procedures to, um, for your company because you, you might have that one person, they always do this. Well, what happens if that person leaves the company? You want to know what steps that they take. And you, so whoever, like a new hire comes in, there's a standard operating procedure for whatever that action is that you're, that you're taking. Roles and responsibility. For this, you want to focus on what CISSP and ISC squared says. So asset owner to them is one person that's responsible for classifying data in the informant in the um, corporation that's not in like a regular job asset owner is just the person that's responsible for that server that laptop and you are responsible for the data on it and that is really a move towards privacy and there's not one person in the organization so usually you know you'll have your director of information security your CISO and they will be talking about overarching and your privacy now there are like privacy directors privacy officers they'll talk about okay how we're going to classify like at a high level but the asset owner is the individual but so just remember this for the test that it's one individual custodian never heard of this in actual working in information security but in the cissp it's an individual who's accountable for executing the security policy and meeting the requirements set by senior management. This in reality would be the director of information security, the CISO, and so on. So, but never heard custodian use, just memorize it for the test. User, according to ISC squared, user is, could be an end user or an operator. So typically user is like your end user and everybody, every employee is an end user at, to some extent, even, you know, the CISO, they're an end user on their laptop, let's say. So, but for, for them, it's the designation of user, whether it be end user or an operator pertains to individuals who are granted authorization, access to a secure system. Again, memorize. Auditor. They can be internal, external. Typically, you think of them as being external. So for SOC 2, you have to have a CPA external come in and then conduct the audit. For ISO 27001, you can have an internal audit assessment 
So there could be a group that's like the internal auditors. When I worked at Cisco, you could volunteer and you could be one of the internal auditors for ISO 27001. And then you will have an external auditor come in and do the official assessment. So basically it's somebody coming in and they're gonna validate your program and are you doing what you say you are doing? You know, are you following your security policy. Now, frameworks and standards. So the ISC squared, they go on and on about COBIT. I have never, I've worked in the tech industry my, you know, whole career, never, not one company has talked about using COBIT, but that's their number one. That's all they talk about. So just throwing that out there. So, you know, NIST cybersecurity framework is the number one framework used within the United States. Outside of the U.S., it's ISO 27001. NIST 853B is basically the controls that all of these frameworks mapped. And now there's all these products popping up because what you can do is once you've met you know, NIST cybersecurity framework, then you can map and show how you meet. Because basically, <clears throat> well, SOC 2 and ISO 27001 are 96% the same. So once you meet one, then you're already, you know, really close to meeting another. And there's just these cross references. Now there's some great tools like Drata, Secure Frame, Sapago that do all the mapping behind the scenes for you and will actually test your controls automatically 24 by 7, which is which is pretty awesome. So Center for Internet Security, that's the best practices for your configuration. And this risk management framework is basically you have to choose a framework and have minimum controls and work towards essentially and prioritizing it because you can't do everything. And then ITIL is like the old style orange book, but it's European, started in the UK. And essentially it's just a set of operational standards and procedures and practices for information security. Thank you so much for watching. Remember to like, subscribe, and notify. Thanks for watching.